Be in control of your money and pay yourself first. If I were to take the money from the HELOC and give it to the investor to make money once, why don't I take it, run it through the policy, and then give it to the investor? Because now I'll make money twice. Now, if you don't have a house, you can still utilize that system by using our policy, by using the IBC. Not only will you be earning dividends and interest on your deposit inside the policy, but now when you borrow it out at a lesser rate, they're actually paying you to use your money to put into an investment to create arbitrage, to cover your HELOC, to make you more money. Okay, guys, well, we'll go ahead and jump on into it. So I'm Brian Fouts, one of the mentors here at The Money Multiplier. You guys may have seen me on some of these calls. And obviously, we got Joe here, HELOC Joe. <laughs> so we're going to be covering some of those kinds of topics here today. Uh, Chris and uh, Stephen are both uh, out right now. Chris is um, recovering from a long trip, getting back. And then Stephen is traveling right now. So you're uh, stuck with us here today. Now, um, I decided to go through a topic here in a moment uh, that is one that I learned about decades ago, uh, and it's been interesting to watch this whole concept kind of come to unfortunate fruition over the last, you know, couple of decades. And if you've been on these calls, you've heard, um, you've heard, you know, Chris and Steven talking about what's going on in the economies, the markets, all these things right now. Um, what are we doing about it? Because there's a lot of things that are going to be happening in the next few years from uh, our perspective. But here's the fun thing is that it's been predicted. And I'm gonna do a little presentation on a, a book that many of have, you have probably read before and uh, kind of go through a summary of what that book talked about back in the 90s about what's happening today. It's a very interesting kind of take on it. And then that gentleman who, one of the gentlemen who wrote that, they wrote a new book here recently. I haven't read it yet. And so I kind of came across this presentation while thinking of what to talk about here today. And I realized, man, I wanna grab this book. So I'm gonna talk about what that one is uh, here in a moment, that second book. And then, of course, we're going to jump into some HELOC questions with Joe here because we've been getting quite a few questions around HELOCs and infinite banking and how they can you know, work together um, or not work together. So I have some clients that have been asking me questions about HELOCs that I couldn't quite answer 100%. So that's why I'm glad to have Joe here. So, um, guys, as we go through this, any questions you have on, on HELOCs, make sure you put those in the chat box or the question box, and we'll get to those here in a little bit. But all right, we're going to go ahead and dive on into it. So, um, but before we go into the stuff, just keep in mind, uh, this is for educational purposes only. We're not financial advisors. Um, this is just for your, your entertainment and education only. There you go, Teresa, right there. So that's <laughs> right there. <laughs> okay, so this is part of a presentation I did on just uh, um, one of my other businesses, which is on wealth literacy and financial education. So what I was talking about before this slide comes up is about what's going on right now in the world, the, the change we're seeing, um, all of these things on the news, national debt, all of this kind of stuff. And so what I look at is what do we want to do about it, right? What are we going to do right now? So control. Right now is one of the best times to get control because if you don't get control of your of three things in your life, they're going to be stolen from you. And these are three things that I truly believe that we all should control. Um, does anybody want to take a guess as to what they are? So there's three things I look at for control. So one of them is is time. Time is one of the most important things that we should control because once it's gone, it's gone, right? Um, the second thing I look at is your mindset, which is knowledge because knowledge is power, right? Uh, the more control you have over your mindset, the more knowledge you have, the more powerful you can become. But the third thing, of course, is going to be money. Money is one of those things that <clears throat> if you don't control it, is going to be stolen from you, just like time, by the way. If you don't control time, it will be stolen from you. So What's this presentation about what I'm going to talk about here? It's about control. So the more knowledge that you have, the more control you can have in your life. So this is something that I came across a long time ago, and I'll share what it is here in a moment. But but why is um why is it important to have control? So here's an example, a little test. Remember COVID? <laughs> so uh, Chris had talked about this as well. That was just an example or a test of how little control people have in their lives. It was insane. And, there's, and what was kind of upsetting to me during COVID was how quickly people gave up control. Like we're like, okay, fine, take control of my time, keep control of my money, whatever it is. We gave it up so easily. And that's a very scary thing. And there's a reason why I'm talking about COVID as an example, because some people believe that it was a test, a test as to see how the populace would respond when it came to control. Now, also, why is control a big deal right now? Well, recession. Okay. 
whether we're in one right now or not, that's not what I'm talking about, or you know, whether we're going to be in the one, everybody has different opinions. But what does a recession mean? It means wealth transfer. Wealth is transferred. And we've seen it time and time again. And so the bottom line is if you don't take action, your money can be lost or is going to be lost uh, when these things happen, wealth transfers happen. So like my question always is, is what's your plan? What's your strategy to survive this? Now, we talk about infinite banking. That is one of the best ways that we have ever seen to take back control of your money, especially when recessions happen. Because with infinite banking, as an example, it's I'm not going to say recession proof, but it is a tool that is there for you to leverage in the middle of a recession. These companies that do this have been through many, many recessions and been profitable. That's why we like to be a part of them. Okay. Yeah, Felix, it's going to get worse, right? Yeah. A lot of people think that it's, it's we're just kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I'm going to talk about why I believe the same thing. So yet, you got to also understand that during troubling times, just like what's his name, Warren Buffett talks about, there's a lot of opportunities if you know kind of what may be coming or you're prepared for what could potentially happen. So that's why I believe that right now is a very good time to get back control. And so here's some things that happened in the, one of the last recessions or recessions. This is kind of cool. WhatsApp, Uber, Airbnb, Pinterest, Instagram, Venmo, and Slack were all started during recessions. It's kind of a cool thing because why? Why were those things started during a recession? Anybody want to guess why? Why they, why they in, Instead of being at a time when the, the market's booming, why were these started in a recession? It's kind of an interesting uh, I, you know, concept. Money. Greg, Greg says money. Yep, that could be one of it. Anybody else want to take a guess as to why these things started during the, during a recession? Necessity. I like that one. Necessity. Need to change. Yes. Um, they solve a problem. There you go. That's the kind of one I was looking at. Is that they solve a problem. Because in a recession, there are problems. There are challenges. And so someone comes up with a solution. There you go. Think of uh, Zoom during COVID. Like their stock went up because they solved a huge problem, which was communication. Make sense? So that's what I always look at is what, what are we solving? So this is something I've done. So I have studied the wealthy. So I've spent a lot of time studying wealthy individuals. I spent a lot of time around them. I've been a part of a lot of masterminds. And because I want to understand how they think, because I understood very early on in my journey that I did not think the same way as a wealthy person because I was not raised that way. Um, I was taught that traditional way of thinking. So. Here's one thing I learned. The wealthy, they get and stay wealthy by looking to the past so they can prepare for what is happening. They don't live in the past per se, but they want to understand what's happened in the past so that I can prepare for tomorrow. Because here's the thing, what's happening right now around us in the markets, the economy, it has been predicted. It's already been predicted. And I did. I kind of would have said, you know, that's bull BS to that in the past. But now that I'm living it, it's kind of crazy because I read this book, which you guys have probably heard about it. I read it years and years ago, and I was like, man, this would be crazy if this happened. Fast forward 10 years, and I'm like, holy crap, it's happening. And it was kind of creepy to see it, okay? But here's the thing. If you have that same knowledge, you can do what the wealthy are doing right now. It's why a lot of people, infinite banking is a big deal because they understand that they can leverage that during a times of a downturn or recession to do things that the average person can't. If the banks aren't lending money, as an example, but you have your own banking policy, you can lend to yourself, you can create massive wealth. Um, has anybody here heard of uh, Ken McElroy? Anybody know Ken McElroy? I know some people have to know who that is. So by the way, that's uh, someone I, I used to know him well in the past. Uh, he's Robert Kiyosaki's real estate person. Like he advised him on, right? And so that gentleman, during one of the last big recessions, his wealth went up like crazy because he started acquiring lots and lots and lots of doors or properties when nobody else could get the money. How is he doing it? Infinite banking. So Robert Kiyosaki is a proponent of this concept. And so a lot of his advisors have that. And so that's how he was able to increase his net worth by buying things at, at a very low price during the last recession using infinite banking and other people's money, by the way. So let's talk about the book that I'm talking about. What am I talking about? Now, from what I've said, does anybody here know what book I'm talking about? Yeah, that's a great book. That's, that was the first book, Rich Dad Porta, that I read that kind of, kind of started to change my way of thinking. Great book, but there's another one, and let's see if anybody knows this one. So this is called The American Prophecy, The Fourth Turning. The longer title is What the Cycles of History Tell Us About America's Next Rendezvous with Destiny by Neil Strauss and, or sorry, William Strauss and Neil Howe in 1997. So how many people have read this book or know of this book? Anybody here? Not a lot of people seem to know about this book, by the way. No. So, so Paul does. Okay. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a fun, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a quick synopsis 
of what this book talked about back when they wrote it in 1997. And then, of course, if we can open this up for some discussions, of course. Uh, but if you haven't read this book, I would recommend it. Um, uh, you can get it on, I think you can get it on audio, um, Audible. Um, uh, cause I printed it out a long time ago. I printed it out cause it's not like it's in like a lot of circulation, but yeah, you can go get it. Just go to Google and you'll see it or uh, Amazon. And you'll see it everywhere there, but it's called the fourth turning, um, a, an American prophecy. It is a, uh, a very in-depth book. It's a lot kind of, kind of technical, but it's very good. But I'm going to kind of talk about the takeaways that I got when I read this book. Um, and that's, this is something that I've, I've come back to many times. So, um, and Joe said he hadn't heard about this book either. So it's kind of interesting. So. What is the fourth turning summary? So it's a quick summary of what this book is. So this book looks back 500 years uh, on the history of like America. This is, they're, they're mainly focused on, by the way, on America, because it's called an American prophecy. And they're looking back 500 years and there's a distinct pattern that they talk about in this book. And if you can see patterns in the past, then you can understand and start to look at to the future. That's why this book was so kind of powerful and why right now there has been a lot of people talking about it. So what it mentions, what it, what they believe is that modern history moves in cycles that are roughly 80 to 100 years, which is the, a human lifespan. And so what they're talking about is generations. So these are cycles of generations and our, our history, you can see this pattern of how our, our um, culture, our um, American, you know, uh, generations move through history. Okay. Now each cycle is composed of four eras or they call these turnings. Right. And so obviously you can talk, you can understand the fourth turning, which is the end of a cycle. That's where we're at right now. And so that last one, the fourth turning is the most perilous and the most traumatic of those four turnings. Okay. And so that's the one where a lot of things happen and you have you know, big, big events and things change a lot. Um, and so the fourth turning, once again, is very perilous and traumatic. And here's the crazy thing. Have we ever experienced a fourth turning in history before? The answer is absolutely, because that's how we know this has happened. So what are some previous fourth turnings? The, and by the way, they're roughly anywhere from, you know, from 10 to 25 to 30 years long. So a previous one was the American Revolution from 1773 to 1794. That was one of the last, uh, you know, fourth turnings. And it ended with the end of the revolution right there, the American Revolution. The Civil War from 1860 to 1865 was another fourth turning, okay? So th keep in mind, these have happened time and time again in history. Well, when, the, when was the last one? The Great Depression and World War II. So from 1929 to approximately 1945 was the last fourth turning. And when you think back to the Great Depression and World War II, were those good times? They're brutal. They were brutal times. I mean. The Great Depression is when 9,000 banks went under, okay? That was a very disastrous time for a lot of people, unless you had infinite banking, by the way, because they were still profitable <laughs> during the Great Depression, still paid dividends. But yes, those were some very tumultuous times. Also, what happened after World War II to the U.S. dollar? Anybody know? It collapsed, essentially, and had to be rebuilt. I mean, it was it got destroyed um, after the World War II, approximately. So there's a lot of things that happened. So next question is, is when is the next fourth turning? And now this is what this book was talking about, is when is that next fourth one? Because when they look back in history, they realize, holy cow, where are we at right now? It's kind of a little scary. Okay, so the next fourth turning, this is what they talked about. They predicted it will start in the first decade, roughly around 2005. That's when they said this fourth turning is going to start. Okay, it will start with a sudden spark that will catalyze a crisis mood, okay? Does anybody want to take a guess as to a few things that happened in the 2000s? What are some events that happened back then, right? 9-11 happened, started, there were some other bad things that happened in the, around 2005, and then of course we started the recession in 2008. Yep, the hell just said it right there. So at the housing crisis, exactly. That was a huge crisis, not just in the US, but around the world, okay? So what happened in 2000s, right? There you go. You guys said it right there. The recession right there. And here's what they said. It's roughly going to last around 20 years. They say 20 to 30 years is how long this fourth turning is going to happen. Kind of a little crazy right now, right? When you think about the time frames of when they said when it's going to start and where are we at right now. They further predicted the next fourth turning will reach a climax involving a pandemic, 
racial tension, political division, and social unrest. And by the way, war. Oh, so what's happened in the last five years? Pretty much everything that they predicted in this book is now coming true. And so when I read this book years ago, because keep in mind they wrote it in 97, I was like, yeah, that that's not going to ever apply to me because I'm thinking, you know, I'm young, dumb, all that kind of stuff. Now, here I am in the middle of it, wishing, wishing I had paid a lot more attention to this book back in the day. But that's what they predicted. What's this all mean, though? Well, eventually, the fourth turning will cultivate or culminate in a crisis and a rebirth. So if you go back and look at the previous fourth turnings, it's a very bad time. But then after that is a kind of a rebirth. Think of World War II. Baby boomers, huge, you know, huge, uh, you know, uh, boon, boon in the, um, the economy, the markets, all that kind of stuff. So there's always a kind of a crash or something like that, and then a complete rebirth. And so this is kind of where we're at right now. So where do you guys think we're at right now? Anybody want to take a, a guess as to where we're at right now? I just kind of told you, but it's a little kind of unnerving, right? Yeah, Greg, yeah, Greg made a comment there that says, my grandma used to say there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. So a lot of people in the levels that I've I've kind of played at and been around for uh, the last kind of may, may, mainly uh, seven years is they talk about this. They talk about this book even. And they say, okay, we're, they're not talking about how am I going to survive this. They're saying, okay, what's the opportunities? What am I going to do during these times? That's kind of a, a, a well, the way they think. It's a bit different than the average person, right? They're seeing these things happening, knowing that there's going to be a huge uh, um, result after the fact of where you can take advantage of it, right? Yes, Todd. Yeah, for, yeah. By the way, they talk about that. By the way, in the book, I believe. Yeah, it's called the the four horsemen. You know, war, famine, pestilence, and death. Yes. So, by the way, the the four horsemen are the four cycles of human life. By the way, of course, they don't talk about the um, the you know the birth though. Um, and then Teresa, yeah. So it's called the fourth turning. That's the that's the the general name. You can just look it up. It's called the fourth turning. What the cycles of history tell us about America's next rendezvous with destiny is like the subtitle of it. But yeah. Yeah, this is a great one, by the way. And I'm going to talk about the next one they got coming up. I haven't read it yet, but I want to see if anybody else here has. All right, so here's a quote from the book, though, that I want to share. So here's the quote that talks about this. It says, sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in history commensurate with the American Revolution, Civil War, and the twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. And so they talk about the risk of catastrophe will be very high. The nation could erupt into insurrection or civil violence or crack up in geographically or succumb to authoritarian rule. So they're talking about what could be the results of this. In the next book, they're talking about they think it's going to like the, the, the big event, like the, what is going to actually kind of come to an end and rebirth is going to be in the early 2030s. So there is some time, right? There is some time. Here's the reason why I paid attention to this and why a lot of people are. These are just some charts. You can go grab any of these charts right now. And Look at when these all started, when they all started to kind of get out of control. Like, they were seriously, you know, in trouble. It's right around when they said the fourth turning is going to start, right around 2005. So if you look at 2005 and a lot of these is when you have a lot of things started just spiraling out of control. So a lot of these charts are backing up what these authors were talking about in that book. That makes sense? It's a little kind of unnerving to see some of these things. And then, of course, you've got guys like Tony Robbins that are actually interviewing uh, one of the authors. So the one of the authors did pass away, by the way, in 2007. This gentleman is still going. Uh, but yeah, so they're interviewing him because they predicted what's happening right now. Not like you know, with, with you know 100% accuracy, but with generalities. And so it's a very kind of interesting um, um, theory. Okay, But you can see other people are talking about it right now because it's just coming true. Um, there, you know, people are saying, you know, how accurate they turned out to be uh, a lot of stuff like that. Um, he has, I think he has a podcast and he does shows. He does interviews about this uh, because a lot of people are saying, what does this mean? What do we do about it? Yeah, Mary. Yeah. You know, Tony, Tony's, uh, you know, is, is awesome. Uh, Modlet Economics. Um, they're talking about this right now. This is actually April 20th, last year, 23, almost a year ago. We're in the middle of it right now. Um, the fourth turning brings huge fundamental changes, political and social. And then they believe that a lot of our core institutions are going to either be impacted or going to collapse or change. We don't know what it's going to mean, though. So the way I'm looking at this is that everything's on the table. I don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be real estate? Is it going to be, you know, Bitcoin? Is it going to be the U.S. dollar going somewhere else? I don't know. But a lot of people believe that because of the, the severity of what's going on right now, 
there's going to be a lot of uh, things on the table that could be impacted. We just don't know. So coming back to originally what I was talking about, control. How much of this four attorney can you control? Pretty much none of it, right? But we can control the things that we can't, we have in our lives. So money, time, mindset, three big things right there. Also, getting your things in place, getting your, your resources set up and structured so that you can take advantage of what happens right now is a huge deal. So infinite banking, big thing right now. A lot of people are realizing that because of the 2008, that the experience they went through there, they don't want to go through the same thing again, which may happen, may not. I'm not going to predict the future, but they're looking at infinite banking as a way to really get their money in a place where they can leverage it when things do change and happen so that they can borrow, put that money to work for them, acquire assets. And so I've had a lot of clients that did infinite banking back in 05. And after 08, 09 hit, they went on a complete buying spree and they just, they completely kind of reversed their, their wealth. And it just kept going up. Like uh, Ken McElroy did the same thing. So kind of keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, accessing, and we're going to talk about HELOC with Joe here in a moment, because if you guys have questions on HELOC, let's kind of talk about those. Because if you have equity in a home right now, as an example, it, mean, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a number on paper. It's, equity is just that. In order to make it work for you, you have to get permission. You have to get permission from a bank. You have to have someone you know come in with cash to sell it. But a HELOC is a way that you can unlock that right now and start getting it to work because we don't know, and Joe can talk about this, we don't know what the ability to get a HELOC is going to be six months down the road, one year down the road. So, so guys, let's kind of dive on to some of that stuff. Now, does anybody have any thoughts on, on the, the fourth turning before we start diving into some more infinite banking you know, focused topics? Yeah, so, so Teresa already had the book. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, oh, now one other thing I will show you, this is the new one. The fourth turning is here. <laughs> so Neil Howe went and wrote a new book, been working on it for a while now. And it's called, you know, the the what the seasons of history tell us and how and when the crisis will end. Because how it will end and then what happens after the rebirth is a big deal. So I have not read this book yet. Just to be honest, I haven't read it. I've, it's been on my list to read. Um, I'm going to do it on Audible. But this is, I'm I'm very excited about this one. But the one thing is that he mentioned in the book is that, it will culminate by the early 2030s in a climax that poses great danger and yet holds great promise. So you can choose which one. You can choose great danger or you can choose, you know, obviously the opposite of that, in my opinion. But it's definitely going to be a this is going to be a good book. I'm really excited for this one. So if you guys haven't read the first one, um, you can read that one first. And I think this one is a standalone, though, as well. So you can probably read this one if you haven't read the first one. But yeah, the fortune is here. That's my next book right there to read. So. I'll leave that up so you guys can look at it, but it's available right now, of course, but I, I have no affiliation with it. <laughs> okay, so you've listened to this one? Okay, so yeah, someone has listened to this one. Yeah, I haven't done it yet, but it's probably long. Okay, I haven't I haven't talked to anybody who's read it yet, so that's why. So it's excellent. Okay, cool. Okay, so how about this? I'm going to go read this book or listen to it, <laughs> and then, uh, because obviously it's good, and then maybe on one of the other calls or something later on, we can do a, a little, um, you know, kind of synopsis of what this one is talking about, because having this kind of knowledge and preparing for it, to me, is a huge deal. It's a big deal. How many times do we got to learn, right? You know, from our past mistakes, right? Before we change our or change ourselves. Uh, for me, I, I'm still learning. <laughs> not, it's not a nerd. He's a cool nerd. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, yeah. So, so hopefully that was edu educational or and entertaining. It's definitely a, a a a long read, but it's a very good one. All right, guys. So, what we want to spend some time on this call doing is is going through some of the stuff around HELOCs, so home equity lines of credit. Now, why do we want to cover that? Well, part of it, as I said right now, is that a lot of people when they come onto our mentor calls for infinite banking are saying, well, I have I have equity in my home, what should I do? My response is usually says, well, do you have a HELOC? I always ask that question. And oftentimes, Joe, the answer is no, they don't have it. And they say, well, mm -hmm. I thought about doing it, but haven't done it yet. So if someone's kind of like, they have equity in their home, whether it's hundred percent or they have equity and they're thinking about a HELOC, they're not quite sure why they should get one or how it could work. What would be like your general response to that? Well, not everybody can qualify for one. Depends on, you know, what the, uh, what the DTI is. And there's like little letters and numbers that you got to kind of know how much money is coming in, how much money is going out. Debt to income is DTI. Right. And, um, you know, so depending on how much credit cards or 
car loans or how much equity, how many, how long have they had the house? All that is determined in regards to HELOCs. There are two different ways to do a HELOC also. Yeah. So we can we can kind of talk about that too. So um, would you say that if someone's thinking about it, would you recommend they actually they at least see they can get approved for one? Well, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, if it's something yeah. available to you, I mean, you should see if you can get approved. There's two different ways to do the HELOC. So if you have a mortgage, you can get a second lien HELOC, which is keeping the mortgage and keeping everything in place and just getting the extra equity out of the house, just like an extra bank account, if you will. So when I ask people and I say, how do you make free money? So if I were to talk to you, Brian, I say, how do you make free money? How would you even know what, what I what I would say? Yeah. So if someone asked me, he said, how do you make free money? I would say by leveraging assets that I currently have that I'm not doing anything with. Leverage. That's number one. Yep. And what do you have to make on it? Make? I mean, it's going to be, you know, obviously profit. So arbitrage spread. Yep. So if you were to go to the bank and say, hey, I have a house and I've been paying on it for five, 10 years, whatever, and I have $100,000 equity in my house. You could go to the bank, get a HELOC. Now a HELOC, home equity line of credit. It needs to be a line of credit and it has to be simple interest. The bank will try to switch you and say, no, you want a loan, you want amortization. No. Wrong. Amortization is devil's arithmetic. <laughs> How... <laughs> How can you pay the same price on day one and 360 months later, 30 years, you still pay that same number? Isn't it's, it ironic? How does that happen? Yeah, it's, uh, it's called Baker's <laughs> math. Yeah, exactly. Devil's arithmetic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you go to the go to the bank and you say, I want a HELOC, home equity line of credit, 100000 They take that 100000 they put it into an account. If you use it, you pay for using it. That would be called opportunity cost. And if you didn't use it, it just stays in the account. So we have to find somebody who wants to borrow that money. So then you call me up and say, hey, Joe, I heard you need $100,000 to flip that house or put it into an investment, yada, yada. So let's pretend that I'm going to pay you 12% to borrow that money and the HELOC is 6%. Yep. So after a month, I send you a thousand dollars. You take five hundred. You pay the HELOC bill, and you have five hundred left in your hand. The second month, I do it again. Thousand. You take five hundred. Pay the bill. Five hundred is left in your hand. We do it for a year. At the end of the year, I give you back the hundred thousand. You replace it back into the HELOC. How much did the HELOC cost you to use? How much money came out of your pocket to pay the HELOC? Yeah, hopefully zero if you're doing it right. Zero. I yeah. I gave you the five the thousand. You took five hundred and paid the HELOC, but you were left with something five hundred in your hand every month. And if we did it for twelve months, you now have six thousand in your hand, and it cost you nothing to do it. Yep. Do you ever feel like you don't have control of your real estate business or your money? That's right. The big banks and the institutions, they're in control, right? I know you've felt that before. Private Money Club puts you back in the driver's seat. As members often tell us, it's a total game changer. Join the community of like-minded lenders and borrowers by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. Okay, so that, that makes sense. So um, I got some questions here now that I've been coming across with a lot of our, our clients and stuff when it comes to infinite banking and HELOC, that kind of stuff. So here's an individual has about $170,000 of equity in the property mm -hmm. on disability. So they own the house outright. There's no mortgage, 170 grand, but they make about 35,000 in income per year mm -hmm. uh, from disability. I think it's disability and social security combined. Can, what can they do? Do they have the HELOC already? Or, no, they no. do not. Well, so now that comes up with, can you qualify for right. the HELOC? So that would be on the debt income ratio. How much do they have in bills already uh, opposed to how much money is coming in? So $36,000 a year would mean $3,000 a month. 
right. and uh, forty five percent debt to income ratio is usually the guideline what banks are kind of lending and borrowing on. What so that have, would mean, no that debt. would mean that they have no debt, no Zero. mortgage. So then they would be able to get a HELOC up to 80% or 90% of the house value, depending on the bank, and okay. utilizing that amount of money that would go to pay the HELOC. So if the HELOC payment was $1,200 a month and they were making $33,000 a month, that would fall right around the 40% DTI mark. And I'm sure that they probably would be accepted then. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Because that, that's, that's one thing that a lot of people are, are saying, well, should I get it or not? I'm always saying, well, do you know if you're going to be qualified next year? Yeah. If the, if the economy takes a takes a hit, is it going to affect your ability to get a HELOC? You never know. So historically, um, have you ever seen a situation where the HELOCs are pulled, where they're cut off, where they, or if you have one, you have no outstanding loans on it, but the bank shuts it off? Has that ever happened? It hasn't happened to me, and I've been using HELOCs since 2010. However... I always keep a line on it because money not in motion does not make money. So why would I keep money inside of my HELOC if I can make a spread on it? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm paying six, 7% for opportunity costs, but if I'm making 12, 20, 30% with forklifts or doing some kind of investment, why, why would I even leave the money inside of that? Correct. And so what Joe said right there is a very good point. Money in motion makes money. Money in equity that's not being borrowed against is making you zero money. A lot of people that have a HELOC that I've come across are equity. It's literally doing nothing for them. That's like having a race car that's in a barn covered in a tarp and not being driven. It's yeah. I, you know, it's like why why even have it then? Just get rid of it then, right? It's more like for me. I'm a car guy. That's why I say that kind of stuff. But go drive the heck out of that car. That's why that's why it's there, right? It's what it's for. It's meant to be driven, and so. Um, with a HELOC, if you're thinking about one or and just go through the process, see if you can get approved. Like that's the first thing. Just you don't even know if you can use it until you know that you can get one. And so, Joe, we have I have some clients that I've uh, been have you talking to right now because of that. Yeah. They're saying they're trying to get into all the numbers and I do this and do that. I'm like, before you get into the numbers, do you know if you can get approved? No. Okay, let's go through that hoop first <laughs> because then we'll know what the answer is. How can you use it? To how to, how to that question. Um, so on my on my call, I do that. I'll uh, yeah. I'll get I'll get your you know the bills, your credit cards. How much is your car loan? How much is the mortgage? Now there is a product out there that I use with the uh, First Savings Bank out of Tennessee, and um, it's called the First Lean HELOC. What they actually do is refinance the house into a HELOC. So when somebody goes to refinance their mortgage, they refinance it into another mortgage, which is amortization, which is a loan, which is controlled by the bank. So they actually want to get the person out of debt. They want to help by doing a first lien HELOC, by using simple interest, by doing a debt consolidation loan. Not only that, but the key to this is the DTI is calculated after all of the consolidation is done. And 99% of all the banks do your DTI prior to the HELOC. That's why the number one reason why the person doesn't qualify. They wouldn't ask for a HELOC if they didn't want to debt consolidate, if they wanted to get more um, money coming in cash flow, right? Uh, That's yeah. the purpose. Okay, so this is a kind of cool. So. Based on what we talked about in the first part of this call with what's happening, getting this stuff in place and doing what Joe just talked about now and not after the fact is a big deal, in my opinion. So um, because if you wait until it's too late, it's too late. So these are some conversations, by the way, that Joe and I are having with clients on a daily basis. That's why I wanted to kind of ask Joe some questions right now to get you guys aware of what's being discussed on a lot of these uh calls we're having because people are thinking about this. So these HELOCs can be very, very powerful, especially when combined with infinite banking as well. But well, regardless, if you have the uh, the possibility of you know, using a HELOC, yeah, I would I would definitely uh, be uh, hopping on a call with Joe, by the way. And I'm Joe, he's probably, he's probably glad that I said that because the calendar is so uh, empty. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I got a text today saying there's no availability on your calendar. What's going on? Well, this is what's going on. I'm always on the phone and, and I'm helping people. So that's that's um, that's a good thing and a bad thing if you want to try to get on the calendar. Yeah, but, we'll, uh, but it is a good thing. Yeah. And we'll put some calendar links here in the chat box for you guys, just so you guys, if you guys want to um, hop on some calls uh, with us. So if you guys, I'll put I'll put I'll do it right now while we're doing this. And then you can put my email too. So if if the calendar isn't open, you can hit me with with my calendar link, Joseph at chrisnoggle.com. So guys, yeah, guys, you have, if you have questions about this, what we're talking about, yeah, definitely um, you know, put in the chat box. There's some questions coming in up here. We'll we'll get to these ones. Uh James, I see yours up there as well. So a question we get quite a bit, um, and appreciate you saying that, Shane, that yeah, Joe's been a great help and yeah, that's one thing that I like. <laughs> yeah, what Joe does, it's not just about, oh, put a HELOC in place. It's looking at what are your goals? What are we trying to accomplish? Why HELOC? Because it's not always the answer, by the way. Just like infinite banking. Infinite banking is not always the solution or the answer to your situation. But when you have more you know, ammo, so to speak, infinite banking, HELOCs, the more things you have, the more ways you can put these together to get to your goals. That makes sense. So, so Brian, I'll, I'll talk personally. So when I met Chris back in 2018, I uh, went to the office and after 16 minutes of sitting down with Chris, he uh, threw the perfect loan proposal in front of me and he was asking me for $225,000 because he wanted to flip a house. Right. So I was like, mm -hmm. I was like, uh, yeah, well, I have to go pick up my daughter from school. He's like, yeah, sure you do. I'm <laughs> like, no, no, really. I'll be back. Excuse. Yeah, sure you will. So at that point in time, I was already eight years in to my HELOC. I started using HELOCs back in 2010 when I figured out the difference between amortization and simple interest. I've been using Velocity Banking using a HELOC since 2010. So they didn't even have these words back then. There was no name for what I was doing. I was just doing it because I figured that it was helping me and I got and I paid the duplex off in a year and a half and my house off in three years. So yeah. it was working. I went, uh, took a check out of my HELOC, check and count, went back to Chris with a blank check and said, who do I write this to? He's like, who are you? I says, I'm Joe, you're Chris, let's make some money. So that was back in 2018. And as you can clearly see, I'm still here. So <laughs> everything worked out. But, but at this same time, I was doing the apples to apples. I was taking the money from the HELOC giving it to the investor. The investor was paying the HELOC and I was left with arbitrage. Yep. Okay. What happened the next year? That's when I got my first IBC policy. And nice. I said, if I were to take the money from the HELOC and give it to the investor to make money once, why don't I take it, run it through the policy and then give it to the investor because now I'll make money twice. So then that's what I've been doing since 2019. So now when it goes to the different different uh, people, now I'm going to start creating a ladder. So the money comes out of the HELOC, runs into the policy. That money will go to investor one. When that investor pays me, that money's going to go to investor two. When that money comes back, that's going to go to investor three and then finally come home for the first journey. So that's going to be the first leg of my journey. So my my circle is going to be getting bigger. So I call that the machine. So it's A, B, C for the machine, right? A would be the HELOC. Or a would, yeah, A would be the HELOC. B would be the policy. C okay. would be the investor. So that would be A, B, C machine. But now I'm going to throw in a couple more legs to see if I can make money four and five different times before it comes back home to Papa. And guys, yeah, definitely keep these questions coming. Uh, I'll try to get them down here in the chat box as well so everybody can see them. So when you borrow from the HELOC joke, and this is, guys, I'm, I'm learning as well because I, I love this stuff and I never stop learning. When you <laughs> borrow from the policy and you have the pol the, the HELOC loan, yeah. you put, and you put that money into the, into the policy. And by the way, this, yeah. is a, this is an infinite banking whole life policy with a mutual company. So Linda asked that question. Um, it's going to be a, a, one of our structured policies that we do infinite banking on. A 70, 30, 80, 20, something like that structure policy with a dump in. So Joe's doing a dump in to get that large amount in there and get 90% of that. Borrowed 90% approximately out of that in the first 30 days. Now you're putting that money into an investor. 
but you've got the HELOC loan though as well. And the payments to that still. You don't... said as well. Why did you say as well? That's why I want to ask because a lot of people say, well, if I borrowed from my HELOC, I have a payment. Yeah. That's the opportunity cost that you have to do. So you have to make sure that the spread is on that. But now let's take it to the next level. What's on B? You said the policy, you borrowed from the policy. Yep. And you're getting 5% inside there, compound dividends. You borrowed from that and you've got the policy now loan taken out the money with, correct? You need to say something along with that. Which part? Don't you make interest on your deposit? Yep, 5%. So if you make interest on your deposit and you borrow at a lesser rate, isn't that an asset from day one? Absolutely. So, so the therefore, you don't worry about the borrowing part from the policy. You're only worried about the spread from the HELOC. Correct. So guys, are you catching what he's saying? That's the key to the secret. Now that turned into a one pot system now because the policy and the HELOC are in tandem working as one. Yep. So the HELOC runs into the policy immediately. How much cash value does one, anyone, want to have in their policy what is the optimum number of cash value in your policy answer as much as possible <laughs> zero <laughs> you don't want any cash value in your policy you want it all moving now when i say that we say we're, what we're talking about is you have cash value there it doesn't go away but how much can you borrow all zero. of it you want it all moving already. yep because it's it's, it's out in motion now that's one of the things that a lot of people all right, trying to wrap their head around. Wait a second. If I borrow a hundred thousand and I had a hundred thousand, well, then how much cash value do I have in the policy? The answer is a hundred thousand, earning you five percent. Yep. It doesn't change the gains on the cash value or the overall deposits, even though you've borrowed. So why wouldn't you borrow? That's the whole point. If you if it if it doesn't change whether you borrow or not, then borrow and go get that money working for you because money in motion makes money, like Joe talks about. So okay. if somebody, if like you just said, if you take money and you deposit it into your policy, into your IBC policy, and you don't borrow it out, all you did was create a glorified savings account. I'm trying to inform you and teach you and have you learn that we're going to use the same dollar twice. Not only will you be earning dividends and interest on your deposit inside the policy, but now when you borrow it out at a lesser rate, they're actually paying you to use your money to put into an investment to create arbitrage, to cover your HELOC, to make you more money. <laughs> so it's a nice little circle. You have to make sure, obviously, that the investment is secure and do your due diligence and make sure that that is going to pay and get arbitrage, you know, spread. You need the spread because yeah. if you're not covering your opportunity cost, well, then that might not be a good investment for you. Makes sense. Okay. All right, guys. Let's have, we got some questions. Let's go ahead and add, answer some of these questions. Then I got a couple more scenarios that um, I'm having some some challenges with. So, okay, where so, where are we going? Where where does the question start? Here? I'll ask them. I'll I'll just I'll, I'll hit them up hit them up right now. So, okay, can, go ahead. you do HELOCs on investment properties. You can do you can do it. Not not first lien HELOCs, but yes, there are banks out there that will allow you to do a HELOC on an investment property. Yes. Okay. Um, what's the name of the product that you use? The one that I'm when I deconsolidate, see, so it depends too. So I just had a client call me up and said that he did not have a mortgage. So I'm like, oh, well, then we're not going to put you into a first lien because that has closing costs. So I don't want you to spend money to make money. I told him to go to three or four different banks, get a community bank, get a credit union, and see what the best rates were and tell me how long they have to keep them for and then come back to me. And then I'll kind of go through the products with them to choose which one he wants. So gotcha. not 100% not of the time will you use the first lien HELOC. I only use that if it's going to benefit the client. Gotcha. Okay. And that's then that's when you would use the first savings of Tennessee. True, true. So then that's when we would go in, we would take out and pay the mortgage. We would pay the car loan. We would pay the thirty thousand dollars in credit card. So now so so now we have the the equity 
paying for all of the bills, creating a one-pot system, debt consolidation. And if we're lucky, we still might have maybe twenty five, fifty thousand on the side that we can still invest. But what that just did was free up cash flow because right. the amount of money that was going out in, into all of those payments are now diminished. Somewhere between 500 to upwards of $2,000 a month sometimes. Right. Depending on what the rates are and how many debts they have. And so one of the concepts I know we talked about, Joe, is that you take that cash flow and what you do with that freed up cash flow is very important because you should don't just go blow it and spend it. It should go mm -hmm. towards something that's going to give you value. I mean, paying down the HELOC is one option, of course. Going to infinite bank is another, another option. But where it goes is extremely important. And yeah. that's why I talk about the segregated bank accounts. Is so if that money's coming into your account and then going out to the debts, but the debts aren't there anymore, make the cash flow the same, but just have it go somewhere else. Be in uh, control of your money yep. and pay yourself first. Yeah. Those are the two things that I definitely emphasize, especially when I talk to my clients. Absolutely. Um, Scott also asks, are, are HELOCs by definition simple interest, including first lien HELOCs? True. Correct. Yeah. Now, they have home equity loans, which are fixed, which is amortization, and that is what the bank is going to push because they make more money. Gotcha. Makes sense. Uh, Michael asks here, my HELOC is charging me 9%. Is that even worth using it? Depends on what your investment is. If you can find that and put that into an investment, that's 12, 15, 20%. That's 9% free that you would be making. Not only that, do you have debt? Do you have credit cards? Do you have a car loan? Why wouldn't you utilize that HELOC and do velocity banking and putting, putting so velocity banking is a key part to a HELOC also when you do a one pot system. So if somebody, Let's say somebody makes $50,000 a year, round number, and, and, and $1,000 a week, right? So as you look at the calendar, 7, 14, 21, 28, four weeks of the month. So if they get paid on the 7th, $1,000 would hit the HELOC. When that $1,000, what did I just tell you? Be in control of your money and pay yourself first, right? Yep. When that $1,000 hits the HELOC on the 7th, what did you just do? You paid $1,000 to yourself, to the principal. Yep. And then the next week, another 1000 on the 14th. What did you just do? You paid $2,000 to the principal. And then on the third month, the third on the 21st, 3000 to the principal. So three quarters of that month, you paid down the debt. How is simple interest made, uh, derived? derived? from the average out of the 30 days. So if you kept on paying down that principal for 21 days, don't you think that it's gonna be lower interest? Now, yeah. what happens the last week? Well, you have to live, don't you? You have to pay your electric bill, pay your gas bill, pay the cable bill, pay the credit cards because you put everything on credit card and at the end of the month, you pay off the credit card. And then they take out the HELOC payment. So you paid all the bills in the last week so that was like taking three steps forward, one step back, right? But what happens on Friday again? What happens on the 28th? Another paycheck. So did you really take a full step back or maybe just a half a step? Yeah. And that is the theory behind velocity also. So if you're paying more to the principal on an average basis within the month and only paying one week out, well, it's quite obvious that the interest is going to be less. Yeah. So by the way, guys, that's, you know, velocity banking and Joe, you, you, you use it all the time though. You don't like yeah. use it and then pay down your debts and then go do something else. You use it every day, all the time. Since 20 year. time. Since 20 time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And so have you done a presentation on exactly that right there? I have done a few conversations, a, a few presentations on on three days and things like that with Chris. Yeah, because you guys understand that there are some recordings out there, but that it's a very powerful. Like I don't have the ability to do it because I don't have a equity in a house that I can use. But yeah, very powerful when you can do that. Now, if you don't have a house, you can still utilize that system by using our policies, by using the IBC. That's that's kind of what it is. So if you think about it, which is 
I, I, I kind I kind of came up with this a few months ago. What is a HELOC? A HELOC is the bank gives lend gives you money, lends you money using your house as collateral, correct? Yep. What's an IBC policy? Don't okay. we get a loan based on our deposit using our life, our death benefit as collateral? Mm -hmm. Isn't an IBC kind of like a HELOC on your body? Yep. Like a bit. <laughs> I mean, they're using your body as collateral, which is the death benefit. So, yeah, it's a HELOC on the house or a HELOC on your body. I mean, it's same, same. So, yeah, that's why except, that's why it works so well together in tandem. Yeah. Except the, the, the uh, policy has other benefits, too. Yes, no opportunity cost, only an asset which keeps on growing and growing. And that's that's a key part. That is a, a definite key part. When yeah. so so somebody would might ask, well, how long do you keep the HELOC for? Well, you can keep the HELOC for you know as long as you want. You can always get another HELOC or keep using the system like I have, like for 14 years. So I think I flip probably about four different times by using this process. Because sometimes they, they, they stay open for 10 years. Sometimes there's, I, I was flipping in the beginning, like every every two and a half years going to a different bank because then they had an upper, uh, you know, an introductory rate and stuff like that. So I still had a mortgage at that point in time until 2013. That's when I became the private money lender by using my HELOC. But anyhow, so let's put it this way. Let's say you have a HELOC and you've been using it for three, four years and you have a, a, a three, $300,000 house and you have a $250,000 HELOC just for the sake of argument. And you do the system, you get out of debt, you get a policy, you start investing. And now you have 250, 300,000 out investing because over the three, four years, obviously, A, you're going to be out of debt. B, you're going to start paying yourself and you're start going to start making money. It, it's automatic. Well, now... You might want another house, don't you? You're only in a $200,000, $300,000 house. Hey, you might want that bigger house on the hill, five hundred, six hundred thousand. dollars $600,000. But you have that HELOC and you have $300,000 out making you, I don't know, what's a good number? Maybe $300,000 making $10,000 a month in interest. So you put the house up for sale. Somebody comes in and buys the house. Well, four or five years on the in the house, don't you think that you might have had a little bit more equity than what you started with with the HELOC. It was a three hundred thousand house. It might be worth four hundred thousand now, right? Yeah, that's so now you, eighty thousand right there. So now, yeah. So now you sell the house for four hundred thousand. You have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar HELOC. So at the closing table, what happens? The purchaser pays the HELOC off, right? Two hundred and fifty. He pays the HELOC off. And what happens? You get an extra hundred and fifty thousand in your hand, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can take that hundred and fifty, put that as a down payment for that six hundred thousand dollar house, right? Yep. But wait a minute, you still have a payment on that six hundred thousand dollar house, don't you? Mm -hmm. What happened to that money, that three hundred thousand that you had lent out? Did you forget about that? That's yep. still out there, making you ten thousand dollars a month, isn't it? You forgot about that. So now you took the 150, put it as a down payment on that $600,000 house and the investments at $10,000 a month is still coming in to pay for your new house now. The circle of money. <laughs> the of life, it's called the circle of money. <laughs> as long as it's still in motion, it'll stay in motion. There you go. All right, guys, we got a, quite a few questions. Let's start to jump into some of these and, and start oh. knocking out. All right, um... So, all right. Someone said here, um, can you run solo 401k money into the policy and get the interest on the deposit and money on the loan? Um, well, you cannot roll a 401k into a policy because that's a qualified plan. You can't do that. Um, can you borrow from a 401k and put it into a policy? Yes, you can. If the numbers make sense, you just got to run through the numbers. Um, they got to make sense. And what you do with the money is what's also extremely important. Because yes, you can borrow from a 401k or IRA into a policy if they have that option. Keep in mind, they're all different and this is not financial advice. Um, and you put in the policy, but then what you do next is what's gonna make the difference. 
if you go and spend the money on frivolous things, you're going to have these payments and it's not going to make sense in most cases. If you invest it and create more cash flow and put the money into motion, there you go. Uh, let's see here. Um, we already answered the 10%. And then Chris asked, how much would you put, will you put into the future premium deposits after the $100,000 dump in? So what he's asking is when Joe did the initial policy of a $100,000 dump in, there are premiums that are ongoing beyond just the $100,000 dump in. Well, that premium is going to be Joe's number. It, it depends on, on what the structure of the policy is, how much he's putting towards it, but you're generally going to be minimum, bare minimum, bare, bare minimum. If you can make it work, is going to be 10000 per year. That's very bare minimum. But most cases is going to be something like fifteen, you know, 20000 premiums per year paid monthly or, or annually. Well, that, so. that's another thing. So we'll, when, you know, if we talk and you're going to do a big dump in like that, um, depending on your age, depending on a couple certain things, um, I've been able to get a money tree in year three and sometimes year two now. So depending on what the next, what your annuals are. So a hundred thousand dollar dump in and somewhere between a 12 to maybe a 15 range. That's a good kind of uh, starting point for a money tree in year two on a policy. Or yep. earth and that's a, that's called that's a very high heck v or high early cash value policy regardless yeah. of the splits by the way because the focus on those kinds is the dump in not the premiums per se because those dump ins are 90 10 structure that's why they're so high early cash value the um, dump the dump in when when the dump in happens it, it kind of throws the algorithm off inside of the the building process so therefore it 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 kind of works tandemly with the annual. So de depending on, you know, the one company that we use. Yep. Um, <clears throat> James asked, can I just add that if your cash value is your emergency fund as well, then sit on a year's worth of expenses uh, before you seek a return on your cash value. I mean, if you want to have cash value or emergency funds outside of your policy, that could make sense. Or if you want to always have your emergency funds liquid, meaning they're not in an, an investment, then that can't apply, but that's a personal kind of financial decision right there. But I get what you're saying. Yeah, you, you, you have to feel warm and fuzzy with the amount of money that you have on on hand. I yeah. mean, that 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 changes with, with anybody and everybody. I mean, there's times that there might be a month that I only have, you know, 3,000 3, on hand that I can just touch. But I know that there's more money coming in. But I mean, like I said, that's a that's a personal preference yeah um shane asked what kind of documentation do you need do you recommend if you borrow 50 from the policy to to your business account to lend out to an investor what kind of inv documentation is going to be dependent upon you and the investor really and your business structure but for me like if you're going to lend to somebody else you better have a note that's going to collateralize something on on the you investor know, if it's is true he, is he asking if he's lending it to his business i, I don't know where that question he, is He's going from a policy to your business to an investor. So, so, so from the policy is going back to your personal checking account. So yep. from your person to the, your business will be a, a loan, a note. And you would charge yourself, you know, a, a nice whatever number it is. Right. Not too high, but, it, you know, it needs to be reasonable. And yep. then you would 1099 INT yourself from your business at the end of the year. So you would be able to get interest on a monthly basis and then do a 1099 INT from your business. It would be a write-off to that business. And then you'd have to claim the income on your 1040. But I'm not an accountant. So and then we have whatever, to put up that disclaimer again. <laughs> if you're lending to another investor, whatever note you have between you and the investor that locks in the interest rates, the terms, the, the collateral, all that kind of stuff is going to be dependent upon that situation. So, okay, this is an interesting one. I already took out a HELOC to buy real estate, still paying off the HELOC. Can I take out a second HELOC to pay off that remaining first HELOC faster and other debts? Well, that is what's called the first lien HELOC. Yeah. The answer is yes. That's what Joe was talking about. And the mortgage too. If you have a mortgage, we can go all the way up to 90% sometimes of your house value and take out the mortgage, take out the first HELOC. Take out your car, take out the credit cards, do a debt consolidation on everything, put it into a one-pot system, take the leftover, run it as a dump through the policy, 
file that through and then you can still keep playing with the with your uh, investments and get yep. more real estate there that way there you go um another great question here what which is better for a lender simple or amortized interest amortized because with amortized interest like a mortgage let's say a 30-year mortgage 80 percent of your payments in the first seven years eight years go to interest so they're getting all of their profit up front on that deal whereas and you're getting almost no uh, reduction of principal in the first eight years that's why refinancing a mortgage can sometimes be one of the worst financial decisions because you reset that interest clock the amortization yep. clock again and you're literally going to be paying out the nose, I mean, to the tune of sometimes more than, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars by doing a smaller payment and a refinance. It is nothing but a paycheck for the bank, period, yeah. the end. Yeah. So I, and I've, I've refinanced my home before and I remember I go, wait a second, am I paying a hundred thousand dollars more for this house by refinancing? Mm -hmm. And like, and all of a sudden, there's like the the uh, mortgage brokers like this. Hey, over here! Don't look at that. Look at me. Look at me. Sign the paper because they're getting I, a huge. They're getting a bunch of money. I see. Brent wants me to talk about good debt versus bad debt. So let's <clears throat> um let let's say that yeah we we went in and we you have a four hundred thousand dollar house. We're able to get a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar line. You 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 only owe a hundred thousand dollars on the house along with your car or something like that. So you have a hundred thousand on the right side, which is good, and you owe two fifty on the left on the left side, which is bad, right? So the mortgage, the car would be the bad debt, but the hundred on this side that we're able to run through the policy and put into an investment would be good debt. So at the end, like in three years, after that money went to work and your paycheck come in, you paid off the HELOC and it's like a teeter-totter. So every time the money comes in, the bad debt goes down, the good debt goes up. Therefore, after three and a half years, all of the bad debt has moved over to the good debt side and all of that is lent out. Mm -hmm. You still owe $400,000 to the HELOC, but you're making money on all that four hundred. dollars so that would be the good debt opposed to the bad debt. We don't want a mortgage. We don't want to owe car payments. We want the entire HELOC lent out, making us arbitrage, making us spread. Just like, but then if we sold the house, we would still have that money coming in and still be able to get another house. And you can buy, here's another thing too, with this product, with this all-in-one, you are able to purchase, purchase, a house with an all-in-one HELOC. Yep. You do not need to be in the house. You do not need to have equity already. What is the difference if you had a house, say you have a $100,000 house and you owned it for 30 years and you paid a mortgage on it for 30 years. You then go to the bank and you say, hello, Mr. Banker, can I get a HELOC? I want 90% house value. They're going to give you $90,000, right? What's the difference if you go on day one and say, I want to purchase a $100,000 house. Here's $10,000 down. You're still going to get a $90,000 HELOC, aren't you? Except you didn't pay devil's arithmetic amortization for 30 years. Yeah. See, so that's another thing. It's mm -hmm. not, and this is what Chris says, it's not what you know, it's what you think you know that just doesn't sell. So yes, there is a product out there that you can purchase a house for the first time with it first lean HELOC yep it's awesome um Felix uh I've been looking at a 40k dump 16k biannually 50 50 split um so Felix, it's going to be up to your numbers I I could run that really fast for you um to see but on a 40k dump in, in a 60k biannually so you're putting in like 30 some thousand dollars per month or I mean per year I think is what you're saying um no yeah. Would be a 50 50 split, it'd probably be a 60 40, maybe even a 70 30 split on the premium. The 40k dumping is going to be a 90 10, no matter what. So, those dumpings are always 90 10. Um, and then the the premium is going to be your own your own ratio that we can optimize the best. So, it's not a um, it's not going to be a, a set in stone 50 50. It could be better than that, it could be different. Um, let's see here. 
Yes, volume of interest versus rate of interest is a big deal. So amortization is volume of interest, not rate. So everybody focus on the rate. They're selling the rate, but what the banks want is volume of interest. They're getting so much interest. I'll give you another example. Last week we were on the phone and the bank that I, the bank has a calculator and they put in the client's information, how much money came into the house on a monthly basis, their income, and how much they owed. They calculated it out that um, I believe that she still had a 27-year mortgage, owed 330000 and she wanted to know what is the difference because the adjustable rate for this product is 7.75, simple interest. After they put it into the computer, they said that she was out of debt in 2.4 years and you're ready for the rate? Are you ready for the rate? <laughs> 0. 0.75. Oh because my. she was using velocity. The money coming in, eating up the principal, that's what it was. So even when you get up, you can't do it that way. That's not, but it doesn't matter the interest rate. The interest rate, if you do what you're supposed to do and you follow it up, like I was talking before, three steps forward, one step back, using the velocity, the interest rate, you're going to eat it up and it's not even going to be what it's supposed to be. So Stuart asked, uh, um, other than equity in the home, what are the other requirements to secure a HELOC? Well, it's just like getting a mortgage. It's the same underwriting yeah. requirement typically. So it's debt to income ratio, income, of course, credit score, credit history is going to be a big deal on there. 45% yeah. debt to income ratio. Um, above a 600, we can work with. It won't be the optimum numbers, but ab above, a, above a 600, we work with. And anything over a 700 gets gets the best kind of rates. Um, I hope that makes sense right there. Um, yeah, those are the requirements. And every lender is going to be a slightly different, of course, too. Yep. All right. This one is an interesting question here. So Joe, he says, Joe, I've been using the HELOC since 2013 and I have a policy that I lend from. I can also lend from my HELOC too. Yes. All lending is out of an LLC single member to investments. I'm new to business, but I believe that you can't commingle business money. However, the LLC is a pass through for taxes. My question is the interest payment. Let's see, my question is the interest payment and do you combine all business and personal money to lower interest from loans uh, increased profit and less interest. So he's talking about how do you cycle the money when it's both business and personal through a HELOC? He just said he's a single proprietor. So therefore it's all in a one pot anyway, and you're yep. going to still pay the same amount on your schedule C at the end of the year. So it really doesn't matter which bank account it's through because you're a sole proprietor and you're still paying 15.3 self-employment tax, but I'm not an accountant. So please look at that and yeah, look into that. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if you have any questions on that, but that's definitely how we look at it. But yeah, running through a CPA and just say, hey, because the one thing you don't want to do is if you have a bank account with an LLC, you're funding personal like clothing, food stuff from that one, from my experience. Because then if you're trying to use the LLC for any kind of asset protection, um, which is called the the veil, if you pierce that veil, you've lost that protection. If you start you know paying for things out of accounts that aren't associated with that. So that's been how I've been out of my CPA. Usually with the LLC, you're, you you created an LLC for a write-off. You created an LLC to to establish business. Any monies that's left in that bank account that you didn't write off on December 31st is going to be moved over and you're still going to pay taxes on it. So in the middle of the year, if you're lending and borrowing money from personal to LLC, if, if you're going to do a capital contribution, you can do it that way also. Um Yes, the money that would come in if you could consolidate it into the HELOC, utilize it when you needed it, why would you want to pay interest on money if you had it? You know how many clients, ready, Brian? How many clients say, I have a HELOC? You do, awesome, but I don't know that much on it. Oh, okay. How much do you owe on your HELOC? Oh, I, I only owe about 15000 Oh, okay. Do you have a savings account? Well, yeah, of course I have a savings account. How much money is in your savings account? Oh, about 30,000. 
Okay, stop. <laughs> How much money are you making in interest on your savings account? Oh, 1% maybe. Oh. How much money are you paying in your HELOC? Nine. Nine percent. Okay, so let me get this straight. You owe fifteen thousand dollars in your HELOC that you're paying the bank nine percent. Yep. You have thirty thousand in a savings account that you're only making one percent on. Yep. Why don't you take that thirty thousand, take fifteen, put it into your HELOC, so you're not paying the bank nine percent? Why do you have to keep envelopes? Why are we doing envelopes? Why are you keeping money separate? Is not that HELOC a, a line of credit that can go in and out and liquid, just like a savings account? Yeah. Well, then why are you doing it? I don't know why I'm doing that because that's <laughs> how I was programmed. That's how you're programmed. You're not programmed to think like this. It's the cash. That's why. The cash. We want to hold yeah. it. Want to hold it. It's my savings. Why? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to keep paying 9%. That's the. And Aaron's on here. Aaron should speak up because. I think in the first five minutes of uh, us discussing, I think I saved them a few hundred dollars a month just because of that. Because it's it, people don't think that way. They think I owe, and the, well, that 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 was to fix up my house. Yeah, well, what about the thirty thousand inside the savings? Can't we just move it over there until we need it again? So I help people and show them, and like you said in the beginning, what is it? Mindset. Mindset. If you don't control your mindset, somebody else will. Yeah. And and if you if you're thinking the opposite of what Joe just talked about, that's exactly the example of of, of it right there. Someone planted a seed into your brain, which made it to your subconscious, and that created your belief system that might not be the best thing for you, might not be serving you. Uh, how many people on this call just says, "Uh oh, maybe I should do that." Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have a key lock, but wait a minute, I have a savings goal. Maybe I should move that over there so I don't pay money. Hey, yep. if I can save you fifty dollars, eighty dollars a month, why would you? Why, why would you want it in the bank's pocket when it could stay in yours? Come on, yep. let's think about it. Yep. All right, uh, James has said here: if you wanted to make it cleaner, it would help to have a separate LLC bank account under that EIN. Absolutely, that is something I I would recommend, and I'll say that is if if you have an entity, you should have a separate bank account for that entity, because if you don't, where are you funneling the money? Because it's got it's got to have an intermediary to go through, and that is a traditional bank in most cases. And I don't want that going through my personal account because that's going to confuse the numbers all over the place, and that can get into kind of messy. Um, Shane asked, "This is a good one. Does the income from my single member LLC add to my W two income for a new policy?" Yes. So you got, you want to look at all assets that you own, all income sources, all revenue sources, because with infinite banking, we're doing the opposite that we want to do with the IRS. With the IRS, mm -hmm. we say. Man, I make a million dollars, but my income's only ten thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah it's like you want to show the million dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by a money tree? A money tree is when when we design policies, 90% of the time it, it takes between three to five years for it to, to to grow that when you put the money in, you're able to take out more than what you put in. So if you put in a dollar. Now you can dig out a dollar three or a dollar five, right? That's what the money tree is. When you're able to take out more than what you put in, a money tree, depending on um, the way it's configured and what our needs and necessities are and how much money we make and what problems are we solving. Well, there's kind of sometimes that we can make a money tree sooner. Yep. There you go. You got, you got someone who loves you, Joe. Who is it? Hey, David Dorothy. <laughs> yep, there you go. Yeah, it's um. So, an interesting thing, kind of, when people talk about the money tree and stuff, Joe, <clears throat> it's it's different for everybody. By the way, it's different for everybody. And so, I have a client right now who's sixty eight years old and wants to get the money tree to be year three, and the break even point, which means they put in total premiums of X, and now the cash value is equal to that or more. It doesn't matter how I split it. 100,000 dumping, 50,000. 10,000 premium, $24,000 premium. It doesn't matter how I've done it. It's year six and, or no, sorry, year seven and year 10. Seven is money tree, 10 is break even point. There is a, there, so there are, it's it, once again, it's everybody's different, but there yeah. are points where it doesn't matter how you dice up this, the, the numbers and stuff. 
age does come into play at that point because of the term insurance cost, which we will get into it on this call. But I've, um, but that's the cool thing. I'm going to actually tap in uh, Craig and say, Craig, can you beat my numbers on this policy for this person? Because I can't make it work like they want it to. But Craig might be able to. Joe might be able to. James asked this question, goes back to your earlier question, questions about HELOCs getting slashed or even eliminated, even though it's never happened to you um, or them, Joe, there is that unfounded fear that it, if they move it from the savings to the, the HELOC to pay it down, what if the banks then reduce or eliminate the line? How long are you going to leave it in there for? You're only going to leave it in the HELOC for a certain time to move it again to the next opportunity. So I don't, it's only there, you know, as soon as you get another 25, 50,000, I deploy it again. So, I mean, just only how long is it going to take you to 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 acquire that much money? Depends on what your income is and, and how much you're bringing in per month. That's kind of where I'm, yeah. I'm at. I, I don't keep anything around. I mean, I saw I saw um, Craig, Craig saying <laughs> Joe doesn't leave three dollars or something like that in an account long enough to keep it going. So I, I, I saw it somewhere in there. I, I got a little laugh. Thanks, Craig. But um that's right. Nothing's lazy. I mean, come on. I mean, as as soon as it comes in, I mean, I deploy it. I mean, why? Why not? Yeah. Now, what he's also asking is, is, is could the banks or the lenders freeze the HELOC? Yes. Anything can happen, right? Anything can happen. You can walk out your door and get hit by a semi. I'm not saying no, it can cannot happen. However, if you keep it, it might, might have a $400,000 line of credit and if I keep 395 to 399 owed constantly, do you think the bank's going to close a HELOC down that I owe them 395,000? Yeah. Probably not. And Probably so not. I have 400 plus a couple more 400s because I've paid off this house, I think, going on four times now. So <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not. They're not going to uh, close my line down. What are they going to say? I'm going to say, oh, I have no money. Close it uh, down. Now, to back up what Joe is saying, so years ago, I had a, I had a lot of PLOCs, personal lines of credit, when banks would lend those. This was in the 2013, 2014 era. Okay, And I had $80,000 of these things I'd got approved for. There's a whole strategy on how to do it. It's five different ones, did it on the same day. Yeah. I didn't. One of them was $40,000. One was thirty. I didn't use one of them for over a year. I went to deploy it. I went to my account and it showed I had a balance of 40,000 or uh, I, I could borrow 40,000. I went to do it and it said denied, denied, denied. What had they done? They had frozen it. Even though there was like a small balance on it, like of like a thousand bucks, they froze the line of credit. Why? Because I didn't use it. And I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it back open again. So what Joe was saying is 100% true. I experienced it where if I didn't use it, they closed it eventually and didn't tell me, by the way, either. They don't tell you. You go to use it and it was done. It was toast. So yes, money in motion makes money, but also money in motion keeps money available <laughs> in my experience. So keep that in mind. Yeah, I mean, if somebody has $100,000 lent out and $1,000 is coming in, of course, it's going to take some time to build up, you know, a year, two years. But even so, if there's movement on the account, like I said, I, it, it hasn't happened to me yet. So I can't really speak on the on the topic. So um, Rob asked a good question here. He said, just closed my first lien HELOC and took a 20K draw. Wanted to pay some debt with the 20K, but can I run it through my policy first and have it count as my next 20 monthly premiums? I pay 1K each month. Ah, so you do understand that you can call up the insurance company and say that you want to switch to annual. If you're in month three of your cycle, you can call up and do the nine months to, to pay it annually. And then... Months, or is it 12 months? You got to pay it one full swoop. One full, yeah. Yeah, you have to pay the full 12, whatever you're at. If you're in three, you have to pay, you have to pay the, the, the nine. Or if you're in six, you got to pay the six. But you can pay the entire... And then go annual. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so and then, the question is there, you're saying, yes, you could do that. You could borrow and funnel it through the policy. Um, but if you're paying down debt, you got to understand that when you funnel it through the policy, it's not 100% will be available mm -hmm. to, to draw upon. So if you put in 20, it might be 60%. It might be 90%. Depends on how you deposit the monies into the account. 
Yeah. Just keep yeah. that in mind. So you got to run those numbers and we can do that for you, help you with that. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. So Craig said the first lien HELOC is a 30 year loan versus the second lien HELOC having more of a risk of being called. Yeah. I don't know. I've never, I've never dealt with that. Um, um, okay, so Linda said, she said this to her host, she said, my mom had a bank recall the business HELOC, even though all the payments were made on time and only half the amount of the HELOC was utilized two years after my father passed away. Bank said, even though the business was still growing forward, they felt a woman doing construction was a wow mm. risk. That, is that well, even say that? I don't think that. That's discrimination. That's discrimination right there. I mean, I, I, wow. Yeah. That's, but I, yeah, so I have heard of stories. I've never heard of anybody directly, but okay. So they called the, the, he, so it's a business HELOC, so maybe a little bit different. Um, but they called all the payment, they Lucy. called it due. <laughs> what year did that happen? 1950, Lucy said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that is kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that would happen now. I mean, if they, if they had that in documented, they would be in huge trouble, I would think. Yeah. yeah. Crazy because that is discrimination. Two thousands, yeah. Wow. I, mean, I, I would think that's that's a huge no no. I would guess. I'm not an attorney, of course, and I have not played one yet on TV. Um, but <laughs> if they ever did that and got got you know that got on record, I would think that would be that would be a problem for them. So yeah, yeah. And that's and see that because it was half used, right? It was only half used. It wasn't all the way at the total limit either. So like like I say, I I. I don't know. Anything is possible, right? Anything is possible. But like I say too, is you have to make hay when the sun shines. So can they can they they can't call a HELOC do, can they? Uh, I don't I, I I would imagine it's a bank. They do whatever they want, whatever they want. What, so well, they, why not? With a mortgage is the due on sale clause, of course. But that's you know, if if the title transferred without you know the bank being involved, that can happen, but so, that's different. So Brian, let, let, let's drop. Let, let's think about this. If you do have the money, hundred thousand, like we discussed, right? You go to the bank and get a like hundred thousand. You put it into an investment. Six months later, that hundred thousand comes back. Yeah, if, if they close the account, I mean, you can always get your principal back with the investment, right? Just depends on how long the investment is. So Scott said his bank said you'd have to convert to an amortized fixed loan. Of course, why not? They'd love that. Yeah, Maybe. that's what they want. Give us a lot of money up front. <laughs> Amortization, fixed loan. Yep. Doubles arithmetic, more money for the bank. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we have hit the 90 minute mark. If there's any last minute questions, go ahead and uh, pump them in there. I think we've got pretty much all of them answered. Um, mindset question Is the goal to deploy the max HELOC amount or to pay down the HELOC balance ASAP? If your money's working for you, do you care about the HELOC balance being paid down if you're if you're covering it with a spread? If that's the if if you, if you have a spread, then why would you care about paying the HELOC down because that money's out there working for you, making a spread? You're profitable. If it's a different scenario, then it could be different. But in that in that regard, then yeah, definitely want to uh, um, pay it down. Or, uh, and D no, David, you're doing it right. That's that, that's where it needs to be. If your if your money if your money is in limbo. You don't want it. You don't want cash value in the policy if you have a HELOC because then you're paying money on the HELOC with opportunity costs. So if your money is in limbo, definitely leave it in the HELOC because we don't want to pay interest on the HELOC because our policy is already an asset making us money. Yeah. So leave it. Leave it in the. Leave it in the HELOC. You're doing it right when you're waiting for the next investment. Figure a month. Figure two. No big deal, right? So who are you using, Joe? Um, I know. Kaylee Ridge at Ridge Lending has an all-in-one loan, but what company is he using? So he's using uh, First Savings of Tennessee. Yeah, I use, for, yeah, First Savings of Tennessee. First, first Lean HELOC, it's called. It's called the First Lean HELOC. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah guys, and um, I put I put our information up there a bit. I don't know. Can you throw mine in again? Yeah, I'll go find it. So, guys, yeah, if you guys want to you know, grab that link right there, that's, I put in Joe's email address as well because he's very busy. <laughs> um <laughs> And that put in mind, mind as well, if you guys want to chat about, you know, HELOCs or infinite banking, uh, different scenarios, you know, just grab a time and we'll go from there. But appreciate all the people on. I love all the interaction. I love all the questions. And um, I appreciate Chris and Steve giving us a chance to hop on and share some uh, different insights and different knowledge. So, um, and by the way, if you guys go and read the, the new book, The Fourth Turning is here, like we talked about. 
yeah, let me know your feedback. I'm going to go try to listen to it here in the next uh, few weeks as well, because uh, more knowledge means more power, means more decisions I can make. That are well, you know what? I, I do want to say something. There still looks like there's, if people still have answers or questions that they want answered, yeah. don't forget to come to Ask Me Anything at 430. Yep. Yep. So we'll be on at 430 as well. So um, yeah, two more just, hours will be Ask Me Anything. I'll be there. Brian will be there. We can keep yeah. ans asking or answering the questions. Yeah. And I'm actually going to, I have a challenge for all the mentors on those. So I like bringing challenges to the group because the, if, if I have a challenge with a client, more minds, more heads, all that kind of stuff. So I got a few that uh, I've been having with some clients. We're trying to make some kind of cool things work. And I want to see if, uh, if the team can, can optimize it even more. So it'll be kind of fun. All right. Thanks everybody. Once again, take care. Right. And we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, you later, guys. Yep. Thanks, Brad. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.